In this week's update, the rotation to defensive gathers pace. What is driving price changes and how far will it go? And precious metals still going nowhere. My name's Gary Davis and as always, this is General Advice and please remember to like and subscribe to the video. All right, we're into the, uh, into the new year and quite a lot has, um, has come to fruition. It's been threatening throughout December as we saw the rotation away from the more aggressive sectors uh, into defensives and, um, and that really is starting to gather pace now. So important to understand what is driving prices so that you don't get caught out. Um, and so that's what the, um, the theme is this morning. Um, so big picture, stock prices were driven higher over the last 35, 40 years, but obviously by numerous things. But the big picture aspects were we've had um, strong earnings growth in America. So stock prices have gone up because earnings are going up and that's no normal. But in addition, we've had periods where the multiples that the stocks have traded on, so either multiples of revenue or multiples of earnings have expanded significantly. And that's occurred because interest rates have gone down for 40 years. And so the the uh, interest rate that gets plugged into the, into the analyst valuation models um, keeps um, spitting out bigger and bigger numbers. And so that meant that stock prices were driven by that dynamic as well. So the two working in conjunction uh, fueled some, you know, seemingly um, unsustainable price rises, but they just went on year after year. Now that it would appear that interest rates have now turned the corner and are now going up, um, it's debatable how quickly and how far those interest rates go up. But I think we can say one thing, and that is that interest rates really aren't going to go down uh, again. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see interest, the 10 year yield down under under 1% again. So they can't go any lower. Um, and so therefore, um, analysts are really projecting forward that interest rates are going to be progressively moving higher. And so that is going to cause a rethink. And it's highly likely, in fact, we're seeing it already, that that expansion of multiples is going to turn around and go the other way and multiples are actually going to contract. And I'll show you an example um, in a minute on, uh, on a couple of stocks just to illustrate that point. So what happens now for markets? And, and you've got to, you know, not just look at the index. Because the S&P is a combination of aggressive and defensive sectors, the moves in the S&P are going to be far, far less than a lot of individual stock or sector moves. Um, so these comments really are directed at what's going to happen to stocks um, individually. So we're going to get a period of adjustment where most of the multiples will decline long term. Now, whether that happens abruptly or happens more smoothly over time, um, you know, remains to be seen. And many stocks um, will be impacted far more or far less than others. So I think there's going to be a huge divergence in the treatment that's, that's given to stocks, how much multiple contraction there is going to be. So how do we go about negotiating the next period? You know, that's, that's the key thing. It's all very interesting to understand why it's happening, but how do we actually get through it? Well, look, you've really got to be right on top of both fundamentals and technicals the technicals being far more important than the fundamentals because when the market starts to shift into negative sentiment, it starts to be driven a lot more by emotion, uh, by panic selling. And so um, your decisions need to be based far more on what the charts are, are saying rather than what the fundamental or valuations are saying because sometimes it can be just completely disconnected. So we do need some sense of valuation. And again, you'll, you'll pick that up when I show you a couple of examples in a minute. So we need some sense of valuation, but we can use these periods of, uh, of panic and excess negativity to advantage, to scoop up high quality stocks that are just being sold down uh, you know, too quickly and are gonna rebound. So let's go and take a look at a couple of examples 
So we'll start with Microsoft first of all, and I, I showed this example with Microsoft several months ago to illustrate that it wasn't really all that expensive when you really looked at the growth rates and the interest rates. Now, interest rates are obviously going to head up. That's going to mean that the, the forward valuations are going to be um, getting reduced by analysts. And so we're just seeing the start of that process just in the last couple of days. You can see some fairly concerted um, downward moves in Microsoft. And we just broke, let's put a line in there. We just broke these little levels of support here, uh, short term support. Uh, at the end of uh, the week. So if we look at the forward earnings estimates for, for financial year 22, which is what the market is obviously now pricing in, the consensus estimate is $9.32. And that puts the stock on a current multiple of 34 times. Now, under a very low interest rate regime, I think that was probably appropriate. And I argued that uh, when I did this example a few months ago. But if we look out a few more years um, to 2024, you can see that the earnings um, are expected to grow significantly up to $13.27. So there's still going to be significant growth in earnings in Microsoft and many other stocks. You know, that is the, the prices are not coming down because the market is concerned about the earnings growth. The prices are coming down because there is an adjustment in the multiple the market is prepared to pay. So where we sat before, the, the financial year 24 estimate represented a multiple of 24 times. Now, if we look at the earnings per share growth, what is fair, what is a fair uh, PE multiple for a stock like Microsoft? Well, if you look at the earnings, so I've, I've taken um, some history, so from 2019 to 2024, so some history and some forward uh, forecasts. And the average, the compound annual growth rate in earnings is 22% per year. So given that, what is a fair multiple to pay for a stock like Microsoft? Well, previously, the market was prepared to pay in the, the mid to high 30s. Let's assume that that is no longer the case in a rising interest rate environment. And the market says, well, OK, we're only going to pay, let's say, 28 times. I'm just using a hypothetical here. I'm not saying that th this is where the market will stop, but just as an assumption, let's say 28 times. If that were the case, then the current price could adjust down to $260. So I'm just giving you an example to give you a sense of how significant this multiple contraction can be. Now to move from 34 to 28 doesn't seem like very much, but the impact on the share price can be quite significant because 260 is right down here and also happens to be, you know, pick up a support level down here as well. So let's just put a line there at, uh, at 260. So it's, it's possible that the price of Microsoft could come all the way down here. Now it may not, or it may take a long, long time, but the other dynamic that, you know, the net result of where the price goes is a balance between the earnings growth pushing the share price higher because I don't think there's any there's any doubt that Microsoft earnings are going to continue to grow. So earnings growth is pushing the price higher, but the multiple contraction, and we don't know what how big that's going to be, is pushing prices down. It's going to be dependent on how quickly interest rates rise. Now that balance will wax and wane on sentiment. When the market is feeling positive, then you're not going to see any impact. When the market's feeling negative, you're going to see a sudden multiple contraction. So that balance is going to shift constantly. And therefore, technical analysis is going to allow us to swing the odds in our favour. Because if we're basing our decisions on, um, on the fundamental valuations, the market could just do something completely different altogether. So this exercise, the point is just to show you that this multiple contraction that's been working in favor of stocks for the last 30, 40 years, it's very likely now that this is going into reverse and it's going to work in the opposite direction. But it's going to affect different stocks to far different degrees. 
So Microsoft, I think, is going to be one of the one of the better performers, the more resilient to this multiple contraction. But let's look at a stock like Square, or it's now called Block. Um, now the price of Block, as you can see, has come down. It was two hundred and eighty dollars in August, and we finished at one hundred and forty dollars uh, on Friday. So virtually a, a fifty percent reduction in the share price. And some people would look at that share price, which is in you know very sharp decline, and think that there's something wrong with the business. But in fact, there's nothing that I'm aware of that's wrong with the business at all. The business is still going along very nicely. But this is about a very concerted multiple contraction. So at $280, the financial year 21 earnings multiple was 160 times PE. Now, that was probably excessive in any interest rate environment, but that was just how the market felt at the time. But once the market got a sniff that interest rates were starting to go up, then the multiple contraction really kicked in big time on Square and many others. So that multiple now is still high. It's come down from 160 down to 80. So it's still high, um, but it's come down a lot. But you can see the share price is now in basically in free fall. And I really have no idea where where the bottom is. Um, you know, we could be looking at sub $90 is is possible. And, you know, it's very unpredictable. And that's why if you're in stocks like this, there's no telling how far they could fall. And, you know, this is a big picture change. This is very significant and you shouldn't ignore where the market is sitting. We've had 35 to 40 years of a certain market dynamic and that market dynamic is now shifting so this is a big deal let's look at some other stocks and again this is all the same Teledoc this is a really good company but it was just ridiculously overvalued and, and the multiples are contracting dramatically this is at Lacian which is an Australian stock listed in um, um, in the US you know, it's now really, so the multiple contraction is really starting to kick in on this one. Look at the volumes. So again, nothing wrong with the stock. This is just the contraction. Um, you know, Twilio, another very, very good business, but clearly now in downtrend. Zoom, which is everyone's pretty familiar with these days. There's been a very significant move from $400. Now we're down to 173 You know, it's lost more than half its value. So when these big picture shifts happen, um, you don't want to just sit there and think that life is going to go back to normal in a short period of time because this is a big picture readjustment. Just a couple of other charts that are important. This is HYG, which is the uh, junk bond um, uh, ETF. And you can see it's, it's rolling over now. We've had very significant volumes in the last three sessions and quite a concerted move. So what this is saying is that uh, junk bonds are being sold off um, at, at a, an increasingly rapid rate. And that indicates a market that's, um, you know, that's getting increasingly nervous and increasingly defensive. Uh, and also this is IWP, which is the Russell um, mid cap uh, growth stocks ETF. And again, you can see we've now broken down. We've, we've broken below these lows here these short-term lows, um, the moving averages are now all rolling over, the price is below all of them, and it would appear pretty clearly that this ETF, along with many, many others, are now moving into, uh, into downtrend. Let's go and look at some of the spread charts because this really tells a, um, a very, very clear story. Um, this is consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Uh, you can see since the 19th of November, um, that's come off considerably and it's heading down quite quickly. So money money flowing out of aggressive into defensive. This is um, the US small cap growth versus small cap value. So when the line is rising, the growth stocks are doing better. When the line is falling and it's falling, you can see here very quickly, it's, you, know, it's, you really have to say it's plunging. Um, then the value stocks are doing far better than the growth stocks. Let's look at the large caps. Large Russell 1000 growth versus 1000 value. Again, you can see just the speed of the move 
in the last week has been quite dramatic. So there's no question we've got a very significant shift on our hands, that's for sure. Now I want to show, uh, so this is the US, this is the best chart that I could find. Um, so this is 1981, when the 10-year interest rate in America was uh, just under 16%, probably just touched 16% at the peak. So you can see for the last 40 years, interest rates have gone down um, in a bit of a sawtooth pattern, but gone down progressively over time. We've hit the bottom pretty close to zero, certainly got down to about uh, 0 0.5, but we're now heading back up again. And it would appear that, um, you know, that that is a new multi-decade dynamic. Okay, so let's have a look now at the American market. The S&P fell 1.9% uh, uh, for the week. As I mentioned in the last video, just before Christmas, the end of December was really rather contrived pricing because we had options expiry, um, you know, leading into that, um, that final week of Christmas. And then of course, low liquidity as well, along with options expiry. Um, and we had very abrupt turnarounds from positive to negative and back again. So, you know, pretty much best to ignore what happened at the end of February, uh, at the end of December. Um, but what we were seeing was this rotation from aggressive sectors uh, to defensive. And that's been brewing for some time, but now it would appear that the main event is starting. The main readjustment phase is starting. And I really don't have a feel at this stage for how far and how long that readjustment will take. We've just got to sit back and, you know, let, see how it, uh, it plays out. Now the US dollar uh, is still in the sort of 95, 96, 97 area, not a lot of change there. Um, the 10 year yield, that's been the big change um, from the last time that I uh, did one of these weekend videos. The, the yield wasn't responding, um, which was indicating the bond market didn't believe the, the, what the Fed was saying. Um, but that has now turned sharply higher in the last uh, couple of weeks. And we now, I think we touched 1.8. Uh, and junk bonds are being sold as well. So clearly the bond market is, um, is feeling the pressure. And um, if that gets untidy, if, you know, if that readjustment in the bond market is not uh, smooth, then that spills over into equities as well. Now the VIX did spike to over 20 uh, during the week, but finished at 18.8. Okay, so let's have a look at the S&P, not that because it covers such a diverse range, you don't really see the dramatic moves in the S&P. You're seeing the dramatic moves at the sector level and, uh, and also at the um, individual stock level. Uh, if we look at the NASDAQ, we can see a bit more there, but we've also got some defensive um, stocks in the NASDAQ as well. So that's sort of masking the, um, you know, what's really happening underneath. This is the, um, uh, the Russell 2000. So this is a small cap index. And you can see we're getting down towards the bottom of the range again that has been in play um, through all of 2021. So that's the, uh, the state of, um, of the US market. This is the US uh, dollar index. So you can see a bit of a negative move on, on Friday, but generally it's just tracking at the same level that it was at in uh, the middle of November. But if we look at the Australian dollar, um, we finished at, uh, at 71.24 and uh, we've managed to, to come back up into this former range. But I think um, I think the overall outlook for the Australian dollar is probably going to be to the to the downside with U.S. interest rates hitting upwards. So 71.24 is where we finished. Um, the ASX 200 was flat for the week, might have changed by one point or two points. Um, but my outlook for large caps for most of the top 100 in Australia is you know, it's probably not, not a great deal happening in, um, in either direction. If the US 
goes into some sharp selling, then naturally we'll see that here. Um, but the place to be remains carefully researched and selected small cap and mid cap stocks that are in the mega trend areas, because being in the mega trend areas means that, you know, it's highly likely that you're going to have a tailwind and you're going to have earnings and sales growth. So that's the place to be. Um, the volatility is going to be high. There's no question about that. We're already seeing it. The percentage moves in a lot of the Australian small caps, you know, got pretty big last week. And that's going to be uncomfortable for some people. But the choice you've got to make is, do you want to avoid the volatility by getting out of really good growth stocks? Or do you want to um, accommodate the volatility by just tweaking your game plan? You know, just take a bit of a different view, amend your approach to accommodate the volatility. You know, to me, the safe place to be is, is not in defensives. The, the safe place to be is in growth because earnings growth over time is going to cover up for other things. You know, because, OK, we're getting multiple contraction, but earnings growth will help balance that out. As, as the Microsoft example showed, so you've got this this two way battle between the the growth and the and the uh, multiple contraction. So you know, to me, that's the way to approach it. Looking at precious metals, uh, gold was uh, down um, thirty two dollars to seventeen ninety seven, and basically, gold is is still stuck. Um, there's really no other way to put it. There hasn't been any change since the last video I did. Uh, three weeks ago, um, and the stocks, um, GDXJ, is still languishing around 20-month lows. So let's take a quick look at um, at the ASX 200. So you can see we're still trading at the level that we were trading at in June. So the, the ASX 200 has gone nowhere in six months, seven months. And frankly, I've struggled to see what's going to change. I, I think we might just see a continuation of that. Uh, if we look at, um, uh, I'll just have a quick peek at the Bitcoin charts. So Bitcoin has certainly been under pressure in this risk off um, environment. We did get to 68,000. Now we're at 41,500. So it's come off quite sharply. Uh, there's gold on a daily basis, but the more relevant chart is really this weekly chart. And you can see we're at the same level that we were at in February of 2021 which is also the same level we're at in July of 2020. So uh, it's been 18 months, really, where, uh, where gold has fluctuated up and down, but it's, we're still at the same level. And silver is, um, is not showing anything better uh, either. GDXJ, um, you can see, you know, big picture. We had a sharp sell-off in, uh, in the COVID crash. We then got up to 65, we've pulled back now to 38, and we're really back at the lows. So we're back at the lows where we were um, in April, coming out of, the, uh, out of the COVID crash, April 2020. So there's really just no, no real joy. I think at some point, gold, gold stocks, precious metal stocks come to the fore, but it's certainly not yet. Turning to other commodities, copper was up a little bit to 437, probably mostly currency move there. But nickel did uh, surge quite strongly up to 944. The, the long term trends uh, would still appear to be higher. Now, crude oil did well, rocketed up uh, to finish at 78.94. It did spike above 80 um, on an intraday basis. So some um, some very significant moves in uh, in the oil sector. Uh, there's spot copper, no real change in the last month or so, and there's the nickel price. We're heading back towards those those all time highs around nine dollars fifty. So wrapping it all up, um, this is a time for waiting. Um, you know, if if you you need to look at your cash levels um, to decide how much exposure and how much cash you want to have. But this is, uh, this is not a time to be, uh, to be a hero. Um, it's definitely a time to wait and see how the US dynamic plays out. The US market 
um, as a whole looks challenging in the short term for, for most areas of growth, um, both small cap and large cap. I don't have uh, much confidence at all that we've seen uh, that we've seen the lows, but it'll be pretty evident, um, you know, when we get there. I I know what the lows look like. I just don't know when and when and where they're going to occur. As far as Aussie large caps go, um, I find it hard to see them progressing very much. Um, the best Aussie small caps, yes, they're going to be impacted if there's a sharp sell in the U.S. Those stocks will might go down for a an hour or two or a day or two, but they'll bounce back pretty quickly and, and they'll largely ignore the US sell-off. Um, it's just that short-term impact and that can quite often be a great opportunity to um, to top up your, uh, your holding. Now, portfolio analysts last week, um, I covered numerous things, but one was the outlook for graphite, which is probably hasn't had the airplay that, that nickel and lithium and uh, and platinum group metals is had, but um, you know graphite is um, is certainly something that should be on your radar. Uh, we also covered expectations for 2022 in uh, at a big picture level, just based on you know what you would normally expect the probabilities to dictate. So that was Portfolio Analyst last week. Uh, if you'd like more information, there is um, the website address and also my email address. And I'm sure it'll be, um, it'll be a pretty fascinating week coming up. So I'll be with you um, next Sunday. Cheers.